Hi, everybody. We're going to start uh, momentarily just waiting for folks to call to call in and we'll get back to you in a second. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. We uh, still have some people uh, joining the webinar, so we'll probably start in about another minute. All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so, uh, again, thank you for a good afternoon or good morning to anyone joining us from Alaska or Hawaii. Uh, thank you for joining us today for this webinar, Payday Lending and Predatory Installment Lending Legalized Nationwide, um, and during which we hope to discuss the looming federal threat to state interest rate laws. Uh, my name is Lisa Stifler, and I am Director of State Policy at the Center for Responsible Lending. I'm joined today in presenting by my colleagues, Charlie Rios, a researcher here at CRL, Lauren Saunders, Associate Director at the National Consumer Law Center, Rebecca Borne, Senior Policy Counsel at CRL, and Graciela Aponte-Diaz, uh, Director of Federal Campaigns at CRL. Um, before passing things on to my colleagues for uh, more information um, and, and for the bulk of the presentation, I wanted to take the moment to um, offer two things. Uh, one is if you have any questions 
uh, throughout the presentation. We do plan to end with um, a period of question and answer. Um, uh, so that in the box, uh, probably on the right hand of your screen, there should be a, a, a place to put in any questions and we'll use those to answer uh, at the end of the presentation. Um, and then two, I'll just uh, sort of set the stage for today's presentation and, and some of what we'll be going over. Um, we're going to be discussing um, the looming threat um, from uh, due to some actions taken by the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, our federal banking regulator, uh, that will bless uh, a rent-to-bank scheme uh, nationwide that has will have the impact of, of really truly threatening uh, some of the most significant state consumer protection laws that exist right now. Um, so we'll go through uh, sort of what the rent-to-bank scheme is, then we'll um, spend some time um, with a little bit of history on, on the use of rent-to-bank historically and currently, uh, then we'll talk about about um, what this proposal is, and then we'll end with how uh, how we can act and uh, what we can do going forward. Uh, so, uh, just to set the stage a little bit, uh, you know, it, interest rate limits are the simple, simplest, and most effective protection against predatory lending. Um, can, and if you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, for millennia, religious traditions have condemned usury, and usury laws are one of our oldest forms of consumer protection in the United States. Uh, states have set interest rate limits uh, since before the uh, American Revolution or the time of American Revolution, and all of the original 13 states had interest rate caps to protect their residents from pre predatory lending. Uh, in more recent years, some states have eliminated their rate caps and others have carved out exceptions for short-term payday loans, uh, but the vast majority of states retain interest rate caps on uh, non-bank installment loans and lines of credit. So on this slide, we just wanted to show where states limit uh, Payday or protect against payday loan debt trap because of uh, interest rate limits, and those are 16 states plus the District of Columbia in in blue. Uh, next slide, please. And then around the country, we have more states that uh, provide for uh, limits, interest rate limits on. Uh, longer term, higher dollar amount loans. On a $2,000 two year loan, uh, all the states in Teal protect against uh, predatory lending and limit interest rates at 36% APR or less. Uh, and, you know, our experience and polling uh, and ballot initiatives show that this is what people want. Uh, in most recent years in South Dakota and Colorado, uh, voters approved ballot initiative uh, interest rate caps uh, for payday loans at more than 70% voting in favor. In California, after a three-year fight last year, uh, the legislature uh, passed AB 539 that put in about uh, about a 36% interest rate limit on loans up to uh, from $2,500 to um, about $9,999, and they had previously been uncapped. And, and you know, a polling shows nationally, and 70% uh, of voters support a 36% annual interest rate on loans, uh, even, and this is across the board uh, and in bipartisan fashion. Next slide, please. So for these larger uh, uh, and longer term loans, which we will be getting into a little bit more uh, in a bit, but just wanted to, again, set the stage. You know, f for a $500 loan, $500 six month loan, 45 states uh, set interest rate limit at a median of 38.5%. Um, but as the loans get larger um, for $2,000 loan or a $10,000 loan, 
the interest rates go down. Uh, and for example, on a $10,000 uh, five-year loan at 36%, that would be uh, about $10,000 in interest. So that is not uh, an afford, and for most people, that's not an affordable loan. However, with rent-to-bank loans, as you see in the red on the bar graph, they uh, carry interest APRs over 100%. We will be delving into this a little bit more, but first I will pass it on to my colleague, Charla Rios. Next slide, please. Great. Thanks so much, Lisa. Can everyone hear me okay? I'm going to assume so. Um, and good afternoon to everyone, and thank you all for being here and joining us in this fight against rent to bank schemes. It's indeed one of the greatest threats to the work done to ensure consumer protections across our state. Um, as Lisa shared, my name is Charla Rios, and I'm a researcher at the Center for Responsible Lending, and I'm going to help to lay the foundation of how Renovank works for those that are newer to the issue, and for those who are familiar, this will be somewhat of a review. Next slide. So to get into how rent a bank works, let's start off with the basics. Next slide. So first, we know that predatory lenders through banks are making loans of 100% APR or more in states with interest rate caps of 36% or less. So the slides of interest rate caps that uh, Lisa shared earlier are being evaded in several states due to this practice. How are they doing this? Well, they're laundering loans through largely out-of-state banks, such as Finwise or Republic Bank that we'll talk a little bit about later, that are not traditionally subject to state interest rate caps. And currently, this practice is largely online. Next slide. So we can think about the rent bank scheme being comprised of three main components that you see on your screen, the predatory lender, the bank, and the borrower. First, the predatory lender. So predatory lenders are subject to rate caps set forth by the state they are wanting to do their business in. So for example, as Lisa mentioned, a predatory lender in California must abide by the interest rate cap for installment loans set forth um, by AB 539, which is the law in California. It's also important to note that in this arrangement, the predatory lender is the entity that interfaces with the borrower in the rent-to-bank scheme. Next is the bank, which is the next player in the scheme, and they serve as the conduit to allow the predatory lender to evade the state interest rate cap by using the bank. Uh, remember that banks are not traditionally subject to state interest rate caps, so the predatory lender is able to say, this is a bank loan. And then finally, ultimately, this in this scheme, the borrower is the person who is preyed upon. Uh, typically, borrowers are not fully aware of this arrangement as they take out the loan. So again, just keep in mind that Rent-A-Bank covers these three components, the predatory lender, the bank, and the borrower. Next slide. Thinking about these three components, let's talk about how Rent -A -Bank, the Rent-A-Bank scheme works in five steps. Next slide. So imagine a borrower receives an ad for quick cash for a loan via email, phone call, text, etc. The borrower may have been targeted based on taking out a previous loan product. The borrower takes out a loan by filling out an application online and submits it for approval to the lender. The lender will process that application from that point. And keep in mind, as I'm going through this process, all of this is being done online. Next slide. Here's where the core of the rent-to-bank scheme happens in this step two. The predatory lender sends the application to the bank. The predatory lender is doing the bulk of the work in processing that application for the borrower. They process the application um, before sending it to the bank, and ultimately the bank acts as the rubber stamp to approve that loan. This process is beneficial, again, to the predatory lender because, as I mentioned before, it allows them to evade the state rate, 
rate caps that are set forth within the state. Next slide. Uh, step three, the bank is sending the money to the consumer via direct deposit or via check, and the consumer may not be fully aware that the funds came from the bank as they have been communicating and interfacing with the predatory lender to get the loan, not the bank that has sent them that uh, check via direct deposit. Next slide. In a day or two, the bank sells the loan back to the predatory lender and gets a cut of the profit. Uh, however, the predatory lender sees the bulk of the profit in comparison to the bank. So they're the ones who ultimately benefit. The bank's benefit is that they receive some profit, but they're off the hook for the loan and have much less risk than the predatory lender. Next slide. Finally, the consumer repays the predatory lender um, under the loan terms that are set forth. The main takeaway is that the predatory lender is doing a large amount of the work to ensure they're able to evade state rate caps and promote their rates. That is one of the biggest takeaways I think we can, we can share, along with many others that will come during this presentation. Um, you'll note on the slide that there's an asterisk. Asterisk, um, that's because we have a real life example of this occurring. Next slide. So the example here shows where a borrower in California borrowed $2,500 from a predatory lender at 185% APR, not 18.5, but 185% APR on a $2,500 loan. She paid this loan of four years because that was the term set forth in the loan, not because of all the interest, but because that was the term length set on a $2,500 loan. And over that time, she paid $16,000 in interest and she paid it in full. Many consumers after two years would not be able to pay that amount of money and would default of, on the loan, which presents its own separate set of challenges, right? So we also wanted to share with you all a video that was from a three-year consumer advocate campaign on AB 539 that um, Lisa and myself have mentioned earlier that did pass and caps loans at $2,500 uh, um, up to right under $10,000. Uh, these comments come from Senator Holly Mitchell on the California House floor in reference to a borrower and their experience. And it's important as we watch this video that she um, is describing a loan that rent -a bank lenders want to continue doing and that the OCC wants to also continue doing. Um, so if we could play that video. In the event that none of us have had the opportunity to have to secure one of these loans, let me walk you through a real life scenario, just so we are all clear before we cast our vote. A unnamed car title loan company gave a gentleman a loan for $2,700 with an APR of 123% I'm not sure if folks with a 35 month video. term on the loan. By the end of the loan term, the borrower will pay $8,123 in interest, a total of $10,823 to borrow $2,700. That makes sense? You think that's appropriate or safe or, or something that you would sign the bottom line when your back was against the wall and you needed $2,700? The loan is secured by the borrower's car. And in the fine print of the credit application, they ask for a copy of the borrower's car keys. This borrower was lured into the store with signs that said they speak Spanish. However, no employee spoke Spanish and they gave him the loan documents all in English. Those are the kinds of scenarios this bill is attempting to address.
thanks so much. Um, next slide. So for those who may have been on the phone, you may have not been able to hear that video, but we're happy to share that link uh, later on. To sum it up, um, it's very similar to this uh, real life example that I shared earlier, um, but um, Senator Mitchell does talk about a borrower who took out a, a car title loan um, and took it out, um, was told that uh, the lending company could, um, um, was able to share the information in Spanish, but they were not able to do that um, or chose not to do that. And all the documents were in English. Um, he signs the loan. They take um, or make a copy of his car keys and, and so forth. So. That's just another example of the kinds of loans that we're talking about and dealing with when we talk about rent bank schemes. Finally, I want to talk some about predatory lending and rent a bank. Predatory lenders are disproportionately, they disproportionately target black and Latino people and communities for loans of more than 100% APR. This shows up in a variety of ways, including the ways that uh, Senator Mitchell mentioned in the video where a loan document was not written in Spanish for the borrower to understand. Next slide. In several research studies done by CRL as well as several other state groups show a common theme of disproportionate targeting. So this example is from Michigan. Uh, in Michigan, payday lenders are more concentrated in African-American and Latino census tracts. Overall, in Michigan census tracts, there were 5.6 lenders per 100,000 people, but in tracts where there were over 50% African-American and Latinos, there were 6.6 6 stores per 100,000 persons. Even when you account for income, the same phenomenon happens. So in Florida, we observed that in low minority and upper income neighborhoods, there were 1.7 payday stores per 100,000 people. As compared to high minority and upper income neighborhoods, there were 4.8 retailers per 100,000 people. And that equates to around three more retailers in those neighborhoods. Although rent-to-bank lenders do not have storefronts and they operate online, they target in a similar way through zip codes and online ads. Uh, many of these lenders who participate in rent to bank also carry both payday and installment loan, high cost installment loan products, and often use data, use, often use data targeted um, that disproportionately affect communities of color under the statement of quote unquote economic inclusion. This often puts borrowers of color among the targeted borrowers. Next slide. Finally, before I pass it off to my colleague, Lauren Saunders at NCLC, I want to draw attention to comments made by the acting comptroller of the currency, Brian Brooks, who stated that he wants to use products like rent to bank to quote unquote, make poor people rich. He likened interest rate caps to price controls on other goods like hamburgers, jeans, automobiles, so forth. And we know that high cost installment loans and payday loans were never intended to make poor people rich at rates with high APRs. Access to credit in this form continually leads to damaged credit, wage garnishment, and a host of other issues for consumers. And especially now in a global health crisis, this is the absolute worst time to have products like these take hold. And with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Lauren Saunders, um, who is the Associate Director at the National Consumer Law Center. Thank you all so much. Great, thanks so much, Sharla. Um, okay, hold on one second. Let me just share my screen here. Um, I apologize, I little technology issue. It would take me one second. Um, Let's see. Okay, so how do I? Um, Your screen. No, Eric. Yeah, but um, but I don't see the presentation. So I actually think let's go back to having Eric advance the slides. I didn't know I had to have it 
logged on to mine. Eric, can you take it back? Yes, I can. Okay, oh, sorry about the glitch. Um, okay, so, um, so I'm gonna be talking about how, so now that you know how Rent-A-Bake works, I'm gonna talk to you about uh, what has actually been happening. Uh, what happened uh, when Renovate first emerged and how Renovate is working today. Um, so next slide. So Renovate lending first started in the late 1990s and the early 2000s. And at that time, it was with traditional payday loans, storefront payday loans. This, of course, was before internet lending, um, but it operated basically the way Charlie described where the you know, person went to a payday loan store and applied for a payday loan, but then uh, the, the paperwork they got actually showed a bank name on it, and the money um, was funded by the bank, but then the payday lender took the money back. And you see a lot of familiar names here on this screen. These are all payday lenders who back in the early 2000s were using banks to funnel their loans through so that they could avoid state rate caps. Uh, because again, because of a combination of federal and state laws, most banks are not subject to any interest rate limit. And so by calling this a bank loan and supposedly funneling it through the bank, they said, well, you know, we can make loans in states that don't allow payday loans. And they did this for a number of years. Um, but after a lot of work and a lot of advocacy from you know, a lot of groups on this call, uh, and eventually, the bank regulators stepped up. The OCC called Rent-A-Bank Lending an abuse of the national charter and shut down its banks from doing it. The FDIC eventually shut down uh, the banks that it regulates from doing Rent-A-Bank payday lending. We had states like Georgia pass a statute to uh, say that it's not a bank loan if the payday lender is really the one with the primary economic interest. We had North Carolina's regulator step up and a lot of litigation uh, by uh, private uh, consumers and some attorneys general. So we got it all shut down by about 2005, traditional rent a bank payday lending was gone. Um, but that unfortunately was not the end of the story. And the payday lending that we're talking about today um, is primarily about installment loans. Uh, next slide. Uh, so uh, we have seen over the last several years a shift in the payday loan industry away from traditional short-term payday loans and into longer, bigger predatory installment loans. And this shift has happened for a number of reasons. Uh, first and foremost, as the data about the huge debt track of traditional payday loans became more and more clear, as the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau started working on a rule, as a number of states started looking at shutting down payday lending, the industry basically has tried to reinvent itself and say, well, we're not payday lenders anymore. We're offering these you know, different kinds of loans, installment loans. And uh, you can see here on this chart how high cost installment loans really exploded in California um, you know, in a span of less than 10 years uh, where you used to have very few loans at very high interest rates and uh, those interest rates went up and up and up. Next slide. And uh, you can see here a, um, uh, some charts from one lender. I think this is um, a Nova. I'm not quite sure. Um, and you can show, see that in 10 years, their revenue went from 98% traditional short-term payday loans to only 11% short-term loans. So, you know, we talk a lot about payday loans, but payday lenders are increasingly getting the bulk of their uh, revenues from longer-term loans, installment loans, and lines of credit. And they have found that not only does this allow themselves to evade protections against payday loans and try to shed that payday loan label, but it actually works really well for them because it's, it's an even bigger and deeper debt trap. Next slide. So here uh, you can see exactly why uh, we say this is a bigger and deeper debt trap. 
Uh, I'm not sure if you can quite see the bottom of it. I can't anyway. Um, you can see, of course, the APR on a bigger, longer loan is lower than it is for a traditional, you know, two week, $300 payday loan. But that doesn't mean it's a more affordable loan. Yes, there are even, you know, installment payments rather than, you know, balloon payments that people end up having to roll over and over and over. But the end result is, well, first of all, you owe a lot more debt. People tend to take out much bigger loans. So at the outset, you've got a, um, You've got a uh, $2,000 loan rather than a $300 loan. So if you run into trouble, it's a lot more difficult to ask for friends or family you know, to bail you out or a credit union loan. You're in debt a lot longer, you know, even with a payday loan rolled over nine times. So you take out 10 loans, which is typical. You're going to be in debt five months with a two-year loan. You're going to have this, this debt due you know, month after month after month for 24 months. And then the uh, total cost is also far higher. Even with, you know, uh, nine rollovers, a $300 loan is going to cost you a total of about $750, whereas a uh, $2,000 two-year installment loan at 149% APR is going to cost you a whopping $6,336. So it's a bigger, deeper debt trap, harder to get out of than even the pernicious debt trap of a traditional payday loan. Next slide. Um, but they have a problem. As the payday lenders move from the short-term loans, which most states allow, as you saw in those original slides, uh, and they moved into installment loans, they found that a lot of states actually have interest rate caps on installment loans. Next slide. So you saw this slide before, right? Look at all those blue states that cap interest rates at 36% or less on a $2,000 installment loan. Next slide. So the answer to this problem is laundering the loan through a bank, through a rent -a bank scheme, just like they did in the old days with short-term payday loans. Next slide. And this is what high-cost installment lending is going to look like in this country if we don't stop rent -a bank lending we will have high interest rate debt trap loans everywhere. And it will not matter if a state caps interest rates. Next slide. So these are some of the rent -a bank schemes that are out there today. These are, and most of these are relatively new. This is a new phenomenon. Uh, it started a few years ago, but it's really been in the last 12 months that we've started to see an explosion of these schemes using a bunch of banks that you've probably never heard of. These are not big major banks. Uh, this is not Bank of America. This is not Wells Fargo. Those banks are staying away from this. This is a number of small rogue banks, primarily in Utah and Kentucky, that are allowing themselves to be used to launder loans. And you know some of these uh, names of the lending products you may not recognize. Some of them are, are newer, but this is how the payday lenders are getting people stuck in debt traps today. So you see here a number of installment loans that are being offered in states that don't allow these kinds of rates. You see there's a line of credit from Elastic, Elastic uh, at over 100% APR. Next slide. And we're also seeing rent -a bank schemes in some other markets. Uh, we're seeing auto title loans being done through rent -a bank scheme. A loan mark has uh, started using a bank to be able to make auto title loans in states that don't allow those kinds of interest rates or that have restrictions on auto title loans that they want to get around. We're seeing um, rent -a bank schemes in the retail finance and, and even auto repair context. People go to a furniture store to buy something and they're saying, oh, you want to pay with installments? No problem. Click here on this tablet. And people sometimes even think it's just a free installment plan and don't realize they've been stuck in a 188% APR loan in a state that doesn't allow that. Or they go to a mechanic for you know, auto repairs and the mechanic says, oh, you know, you're having trouble paying? No problem. Click on this tablet and you're stuck in, you know, in a, a loan well over 100%. And we're also seeing rent -a bank a lending being done in the small business area. Uh, world business lenders have uh, been profiled by the Wall Street Journal 
that's being populated by a bunch of people who helped cause our mortgage crisis. Uh, they're laundering their loans through Access Bank, uh, which is an OTC regulated bank, and they secure their business loans often by the small business owner's home. So these are basically mortgages at 75 to 139 percent APR, and you know, surprise, surprise, people end up in foreclosure. Um, there's some other small business rent bank lenders on here as well. Next slide. So here's a map of one lender. Um, this is uh, Rise, which is a product of Elevate. And you can see here they are picking and choosing where they use the rent bank model. So they are staying out of the green states. They tend to stay out for now out of states that are challenging them. There's no legal reason that they, they are staying out of those states for the most part, um, but they know that there are aggressive AGs or just for other reasons, those states have a history of pushing back against evasions of their rate caps. The white states are states that allow high cost lending. They don't need to use a rent bank scheme, so they're just making the loans directly. But they change the form of their loan. They do it through a bank in the blue states. And those blue states are all states that don't allow you know, the 150% you know, or more rate that Elevate is charging uh, for its rise loans. Next slide. So uh, this is another uh, loan. This is um, Innova's net credit. And a little different, you know, map here. But again, they're picking, they're choosing. Sometimes they adjust the size of the loan or even the rate to fit within what the state allows. So you might see a few more, you know, different white states here. But again, those blue states are places that have laws that don't allow, allow their high rate loans and they are laundering it through a bank to get around those state laws. Next slide. And then this is the last one I'm going to show you. This is op loans. Um, again, uh, the blue states, you know, including California, where, you know, the le legislature overwhelmingly passed um, a law tightening up the rates on installment loans. Um, a bunch of the rent bank lenders are staying out of California because, you know, uh, of fear that there's going to be a crackdown, but Op Loans has taken their chances and they're in there as well as a bunch of other blue states. But there are, you know, a number of green states they're staying out of right now. Next slide. So on our website, you can see the link there at the bottom of the page. We have a, 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 pay, a watch list where we're trying to keep an eye on how many and which rent bank lenders are in which states. So you can go to our website and you can see who's lending in your state. Next slide. Um, but rent bank lending, even though it's happening, is under threat and it's being threatened by state attorneys generals, and it's being threatened by the courts. Uh, just a few weeks ago, the DC Attorney General Racine sued Elevate uh, for making illegal high interest loans in DC in evasion of its rate cap, and it, uh, uh, the Attorney General alleged that the bank is actually not the true lender, that it's really Elevate, and they're the one running the show and making the profits and they have to abide by uh, DC's interest rate laws. You can see here an op-ed headline from California um, that you know there's going to be a fight coming because California is not going to stand up for allowing its laws to be evaded. The Colorado Attorney General sued an online lender claiming that it was the true lender, not the bank, and had to abide by state rate caps. And then uh, back in uh, 2016, there was an important decision out of West Virginia that said that Cash Call uh, could not use a bank to launder its loans and avoid West Virginia's uh, rate cap. So we've got, you know, uh, some tools, and this scheme is, is under threat. And because of that, the rent bank lenders are turning to our federal banking regulators to help them out. And I'm going to turn this over to Rebecca to tell us how. Next slide, please, Eric. Great. So as Lauren noted, um, regulators, federal and state, and state AGs, have challenged rent-a-bank schemes over the years. 
And they've done that primarily using what's known as the true lender doctrine. This doctrine is a long-standing anti-evasion doctrine where courts look beyond the fine print. And they typically ask the question, um, which party has the predominant economic interest in the loan? In other words, the courts follow the money. Who's making the money? Who's profiting off of these loans? Who has the real interest in these loans? That party is the true lender. And in the Renovate scheme, the reality is that this is always, next slide, the non-bank predatory lender. Courts have generally made that finding, and as a result, they've generally held that state interest rate limits apply to these loans, that they're not bank loans, they're non-bank loans, and state rates apply. Um, courts usually base this test on the totality of the circumstances. So for example, even though a bank may have their name on the loan document and technically or nominally be the originator of the loan, the court looks to see that the bank sells the loans back to the non-bank um, and that the non-bank has the real interest and so the non-bank is the true lender. Next slide. So Lauren noted also that the OCC itself for years has frowned upon rent-to-bank schemes. They've told their banks not to do it. They've said that you know, selling their charter um, is an abuse of the national charter. But they have really changed course. Um, and last week, they um, proposed an outrageous rule that would totally gut the true lender doctrine. Their proposal says that the bank is the true lender. So long as either the bank is named as the lender on the loan document. So that is all about the fine print. You know, the, the courts look past the fine print. Um, but the OCC's proposal is really all about the fine print. Um, or if the bank funds the loan, then also the bank would be considered the true lender. Next slide. So now we can take a look at some fine print. Um, this is a 2004 document from when Rent-A-Bank was happening in North Carolina with short-term payday loans. It's a collection letter from Payday Lender Advance America to the borrower in, in Durham. Um, but you can see there that it says that the loan agreement is with Republic Bank. So while Advance America was driven out in the mid 2000s um, because they weren't the true lender, under an OCC rule today, if it were finalized, Advance America would be the true lender. I'm sorry, the bank, Republic Bank, would be the true lender because its name is on the loan agreement. Um, and this really shows how easy it would be for Rent a Bank to not only expand with installment loans where it's already happening to some extent, but also to return with short term payday loans as well, including in states that are currently payday loan free, like North Carolina. Next slide. So what do the predatory lenders think of the OCC's proposal? They like it. Um, predatory lender Elevate here is commending, um, they've commended the OCC's action for, um, for, it, for its clarity. Um, and they, they also said in their statement, especially now during times of economic difficulty, it is critical that we preserve and promote innovation, partnership, and access to credit for non-prime borrowers. So again, we're seeing this theme of helping non-prime borrowers, this financial inclusion theme um, that the acting comptroller you know, has also put forward. Um, Elevate's average APR in 2019 was 122%. They are evading state laws in the majority of states, and they have a charge-off rate of 50% of revenues, and they call this financial inclusion. So the effects of this proposal are really unmistakable. National banks and non-banks could engage in rent-a-bank schemes with the OCC's blessing. If the OCC has its way, um, and Comptroller, Acting Comptroller Brooks has actually said this basically, um, it would insulate these schemes from litigation. So it would, it would really strip states of their most meaningful tool to protect their interest rate limits from these schemes, the true lender doctrine. Um, 
A similar proposal from the FDIC could come soon, which would mean that state charter banks would have this same kind of blessing to engage in rent a bank schemes. Um, and predatory loans would likely spread to all 50 states. So in sum, it would be a disastrous policy grounded in the patently false notion that predatory loan products are going to raise people out of poverty. So where is the hope in this? Um, well, the proposal is far from a done deal. It's a proposal. There's a comment period that Graciela will talk about next, and that's all of our opportunity to make our concerns known and to get those concerns into the agency's administrative record that underlies this rule. And further, um, the OCC does not have the legal authority to, to do this rule, to preempt state law by deciding what is or is not evasion of that state law. And ultimately, even if the OCC rule is finalized, next slide, please. Even if the, um, even if the rule is finalized, OCC rules are subject to legal challenge. Just yesterday, the Attorneys General of California, Illinois, and New York sued the OCC over a different recently finalized rule that also threatens state rate caps in a, in a related but different way. Um, and a number of states are very concerned about the OCC's exceeding its authority to undermine, to undermine state law. So I'll turn it over to Graciela now to talk about what we all can do. All right, thank you, Rebecca. And I um, hope you guys can hear me well. So I'm Graciela Aponte Diaz. Um, and actually, if you can go to the next slide, but my, my contact information is there. And so as I'm going through all of these things, if there's any questions on action items, um, please feel free to email me. Uh, so you're sitting there and you're fired up because this is a really bad thing. And uh, now you want to know what you can do. So let's go to the next slide and figure out some actionable items uh, that you can do. So, so the um, proposed rule was issued a couple weeks ago, and we have a certain time frame where we can submit public comments. And that deadline is September 3rd. And so what we want to do, I mean, I don't know if you guys can see this, but there are 200 participants on this webinar today, which is really cool for like a really complicated, wonky issue like this rule from the OCC. But but I think you all realize, uh, you know, how much of a threat it is. And so just, just the numbers of folks that are on really, really shows that. And so what we'd like to do is, um, is take this energy that you guys have around this and um, and submit a comment letter. And so uh, comment letters, you know, from different states talking about different pieces, right? So some of you come from states that have a strong interest rate cap. And, you know, this evasion is, is you know, obviously you don't want these uh, loans in your state. Um, some of you have recently enacted interest rate caps and you really don't want these loans in your state. Um, and some of you are, are still fighting for rate caps. And so I think all of those different perspectives um, put into a comment letter would be extremely helpful. And so, um, so that's one piece. All of that has to be filed. You know, the OCC has an obligation to look through each one of them. Um, you know, if there are, you know, you know, if this becomes a final rule, like Rebecca mentioned, there are legal challenges and we can point to the examples that you guys provide. Like this is what was happening in my state. We had this interest rate cap and we don't want these back. And so it's, it's really important to put those very specific experiences into the comment letters. So that's number one. Um, that is of the most urgent. We are uh, happy to help with any sample comment letters, let you know where it needs to be sent, give reminders and things like that. So we have all of your email addresses. We'll send kind of more information in, in the next slide. Don't, don't go to the next slide yet, but in the next slide, you'll see we have some resources where you'll also see um, more updates um, and more help that we can give you guys 
if, if you would like to submit that public comment. So that's number one. Uh, secondly, just elevating this issue in the media through social media, through op-eds, you know, having some, some uh, leaders talk about these issues, um, editorial board memos, there's all kinds of ways to make this uh, really um, just highlighted in the media. So, um, so we'll also provide you guys information um, once we, you know, engage in, you know, tweeting and social media and all those Twitter storms and all those great things that we do to, to elevate these issues. Um, so, so, and, and it's, it's a complicated issue as you guys have seen. So we are trying to develop some materials, um, like a, a video, an animated video that goes through this new graphics. And so as those comments to the works, we'll, um, send you that information and hope that you can highlight this issue in the media. Um, the next thing that is super important is collecting and sharing borrower stories. And so um, this is another place where um, it's so important to hear, like, how did this really impact my constituents? Um, what happened, right? Like, how did you hear, how did you hear about this loan? Why did you take it? Did you know about the interest rate? all like then you kind of like dig into like all the predatory nature that um that that happens behind the scenes i know we had a little trouble with the audio so not everyone heard the, the video but you know there's just all kinds of luring and preying on uh communities of color that happens in this process and you know people are like whoa what am i paying back and so it's really important to capture those stories so we're developing a tool um, where it will have a survey, we'll send you guys the link so you can ask the specific questions, like you, so you know which are the rent -a bank lenders' names, um, and, and so that you can kind of survey some of the constituents and clients that you guys work with. Um, the next bullet is about um, sharing that information with your local representative. So, congressional members, you know, sharing those stories with them so that they can become more champions on these issues there's um there, there was a rent -a bank hearing back in february where representative rashida halib was very vocal about not wanting these rent -a bank schemes in her district senator ben holland from maryland uh katie porter from california so the more information we can feed them about direct impact on consumers um would be really helpful uh, because they can do a comment letter um they can hold hearings they can bring the OCC acting director uh, to uh, to a hearing. Um, all, all kinds of other, you know, they could pass a uh, federal rate cap. Um, there's tons of other things that, that we want um, uh, them to do, so we want to elevate these stories for them. Uh, let's see. Let's do, yeah, let's do the next slide. So these are some resources that we're working on. Each of these web pages has information about uh rent a bank so be more uh added to the crl site we're, we're working on that um nclc uh has a great website with lots of resources and then on stop the debt trap that's the one where we are going to put up um like survey borrower collections and things like that um and let's see before I before I close, just to say, sorry, I kind of skimmed over the 36% rate cap, but there there is a bill currently um, introduced on the House side to to enact a federal 36% um, rate cap bill, and that is something we've been pushing really hard for, especially during COVID. Um, so th those are some. Um, actionable things that we can ask of our congressional members as we're talking about this threat and as we're talking about just the problem in general with um, with these very high cost loans. So with that, I'm going to pause and turn it over to Lisa, who opened up the call. Um, and so, uh, Lisa. Thank you, Graciela, and thank you to Charla, Lauren, and Rebecca for the information that they shared. Uh, this afternoon, uh, 
before we open it up, we already have a, we already have quite a few questions coming in. But before we open it up, I just wanted to uh, I think it has been made clear the threat that this uh, proposal from the OCC poses to the st in the states. Um, it poses um, it, it threat. It will be threatening those states with strong rate caps and, and and limits on interest that can be charged across the country, but also on future efforts to ensure that uh, the loans made in the states are not wealth stripping loans. Uh, and don't cause people to get stuck in a, a cycle of debt and ones that, as have we've have uh, established, tend to target communities of color and low-income uh, borrowers as well. Um, so thank you for joining us and listening in. And why don't we go ahead and uh, start with some of the questions? Yes, thank you, Lisa. Okay, so let me make sure I can see all of these. Um, I saw one early on um that lisa if you can help us answer she she was hold on sorry i'm having a little problem here but um just recalling the question uh she was asking where in the process does a 36 percent cap bill turn into 100 percent apr or higher um oh here it is it's it's still unclear to me where the apr gets raised past 36 percent it happens at the rent a bank question mark. So this was Galen um, Young who asked that question. Um, so I think I'll I'll try to answer it um, based on what I know. So um, one of the important pieces in the rent the rent a bank scheme uh, or scam that happens is uh, national banks that are uh, regulated by the OCC. Uh, these are the the big banks that we all know, um, the Wells Fargo and the the City and the Bank of America as examples, and then the federally insured or the uh, we commonly hear FDIC insured banks. Um, the some of the names we've used are Finwise and Republic Bank. They have um, under federal uh, patchwork of federal laws have the ability to um, of avoid state interest rate limits on things like payday and installment loans. Uh, and so they have the ability to charge higher rates. And what happens is when these non-bank lenders, uh, like the installment lenders or the payday lenders or these online lenders, um, like Elevate, uh, like Oplins, they try to take advantage of what bank, the privilege the banks have to charge higher rates uh, by so-called partnering with them uh, and making these arrangements so that um, they can try to uh, funnel the loans through the banks and, and, and take advantage of that um, high, that privilege. But in reality, uh, I, you know, what we've tried to lay out is that those, um, those arrangements are just schemes and scams. Uh, and in reality, the non-bank lenders, the, the entities that are interfacing with the borrower are the ones that are really truly the lenders. I don't know if that answers the question. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, the next, let's see if I can organize myself here because they're moving around. So I'm going to delete that. Yeah, question. you know, Graciela, I could jump in and answer the next question if you like. Okay. Wh which one are you answering? Sorry. Maybe uh, you could just read the it. Next and... one. <laughs> yeah. Um, how much profit must the bank make under the traditional common law to be considered a true lender? Um, so the the uh, this is you know not not well for the most part it's not statutory although Cal Georgia does have a statute but it just says predominant economic interest. Um, you know, I, I, of course, usually don't get into the numbers, but I think it's generally understood, you know, over 50%, um, or at least more than the bank. Um, there is one case that, you know, held that 49, the, the lender was still, had the predominant economic interest at 49% because, you know, it was an evasion to set it at that level. Um, but in, in most cases, it's not a close call. Uh, in most of these rent bank schemes, the bank is selling about 96% of the, you know, of the profits. 
Um, and they've gotten more sophisticated. They don't typically just completely sell the loan and get out of the business anymore. Um, they technically hold on to the account. They sell the right to receive the payments. They, um, you know, sometimes use complicated vehicles for receiving those payments. But the bottom line is about 96% of the interest in the loan goes on to the predatory lender and the bank keeps, you know, about 4%. All right. Thank you, Lauren. Um, there are, I think there's two, uh, well, Rebecca, maybe I can um, ping you for this one. Um, but some, uh, Jerry Hartzell is asking about the Congressional Review Act and um, assuming he's mm -hmm. asking if that's a tool for defense. Yeah, so others could add more perhaps, but so for those who aren't familiar, you know, the Congressional Review Act is a law that um, within a certain period of time after an agency rule gets finalized, it allows Congress to overturn that rule in an expedited, using expedited process where um, there is no filibuster. And so the, um, the kind of effect of that is that you only need a simple majority in each chamber um, to pass um, an, a, a congressional react resolution. So it does look like this rule would be finalized within the window of um, within the window where Congress would be able to use a congressional direct resolution. Um, you know, so I think that might be part of a strategy, but at the same time, um, there's a lot of rules that if 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 the makeup of Congress were to change. There's a lot of rules that have happened toward the end of this administration, or you know, toward leading up to the election, um, that a lot of different groups and a lot of different areas would want to see overturned. Um, so I think that's one challenge, um, among others. But I do think that it, it would be a possibility. I don't know if others want to say more. Okay. Right. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, the next question, um, Charla, can you uh, expand on, it's from Karen Myers, what is the bill number in the House and sponsor? So I think she's uh, referring to the 36% cap bill that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, uh, it's HR 5050 in the House, and the sponsor is um, um, Chewy Garcia. Um, in Illinois, and there are several co-sponsors. I can put the link to it in the in the chat box. And it's Senator Merkley in the Senate, but I don't recall the Senate number. We can um I'll note that we can probably provide some additional information on the resources that we send as well. I think it's um, S twenty eight thirty three. Sorry, I think it's S2833. Okay. Um, Lisa, next question. Is there anything helpful state legislators can do? Yes. Uh, I think along the lines of, of weighing in, I mean, many times state I mean, state legislators are the ones who are are helping pass the uh, these strong laws or protect these strong laws from the threats that we've seen over the years um, in the states to, for example, expand uh, the predatory loan products available in states to allow for these high cost uh, installment uh, predatory installment loans. So states can uh, state legislators. Uh, could um, write op-eds and engage in, in f f media and social media, um, laying out that work that they've done over the years. Um, they can file comments with the OCC just like everyone else. And, you know, in fact, in some of the states that have fought hard uh, to um, get rate caps or to protect their uh, interest rate limits, um, that would be great. Uh, sort of uh, that would add a lot of value uh reach out to your congressional delegation to your state ag to your governor to encourage them to weigh in uh so there are quite a just 
uh, like everyone else, I think state legislators could, could weigh in publicly in, in, in the same way. Thank you, Lisa. Um, the next question for Lauren. Um, hold on. It always happens to me, Lauren, when I'm trying to. It was the one about bigger banks engaging, but um, here it is. Yeah. And if, if this, this rule goes through, yep, if this rule goes through, what are the chances that bigger named banks will get into the line of business? So I don't think we're going to see big banks involved in rent a bank schemes um, because I don't think they want to affiliate themselves with these particular lenders. But we are worried about big banks offering their own bank payday loans. Um, as you may recall, uh, back um, you know before 2013, Wells Fargo, U.S. Bank, Fifth Third, which is now a national bank, and Regions Bank were making their own payday loans. Um, at rates of about 200%. And these were short-term, you know, payday loans, you know, re repaid immediately with your next deposit. And unfortunately, the same OCC has repealed its guidance that had shut down those bank payday loans, and the FDIC repealed their guidance, and they've been making noises about single payment bank loans. Um, so we are very worried about uh, banks getting back into the payday loan business. And that's another reason we need a national 36% rate cap that applies to everybody, including banks. You know, a national 36% rate cap would cut off the worst of this rent -a bank lending. Nothing could be above 36%. And it would also stop banks from entering into their own, you know, high cost products. Um, but mostly it's these small banks you've never heard of that are harder to rein in because they don't really care about their reputations and they're making a lot of fees by aligning themselves with predatory lenders for the rent bank schemes. Okay. Thank you, Lauren. Um, this is a two-part question um, from Sarah. I think, Rebecca, I'm going to ping you for part one. So this question has two related parts. Number one, what are our most effective political strategies for defeating this proposal since this administration will not be swayed by comments we write? So Rebecca, if you're, still, if you're on mute. I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Sorry about that. Um, so thanks for that question. I mean, I think that where we have been focusing in terms of what we can do now is to really make a lot of noise about how horrible this proposal is and how, um, how devastating the impact will be. And so for the moment, we're re we really are focused on the comment period. Um, I think um, moving forward, um, we will have to kind of wait and see what happens, you know, how long, how long Acting Comptroller Books is there. There was another question that asked, um, that asked if the administration were to change what that looks like for the agencies and, um, a new administration would have the authority to, replace the OCC comptroller um, really as soon as they would, would want to. Um, but I think for now, um, the more sort of that we can highlight how bad this is and, and really how, how audaciously it's exceeding the OCC's authority, we are kind of putting ourselves in the best position to be able to potentially unwind this. Um, whether it's through uh, the agency itself, via Congress, or or litigation, any of those strategies. I don't know if others have more to add. Yeah, this is Lauren. Um, I'll jump in on that too. Um, yes, I mean we don't expect to change, you know, Comptroller Brooks's mind about this, but comments are still really important. They are part of the record, and if you know they have a duty to consider them. 
And we you know we do think it's very likely there will be a challenge to this rule. And so the more that there is in the record and the less that they actually paid attention to comments, you know, the more likely it just helps to the litigation challenge to overturn it. Um, it's also uh, a lot of comments and not only sending them directly to the OCC, but then sending them on to your, you know, federal and state legislators um, highlights the importance of this issue. It's not one that actually, you know, rises to the top a lot. There's a lot going on in Congress right now. And even if your members of Congress, you know, agree with us on this, you know, they've got a lot of fights to fight. And we want them to fight this one, too. We need to make a uh, clear that it's important for Congress to act directly and for, you know, for leader, progressive leaders to uh, make changing this a top priority. If there is, you know, a change of administration next year, we want this, you know, issue high on the list. And we, we're fighting with a lot of, you know, things, right? There's a lot going on and immigration and civil rights and, and environmental issues. And, uh, but predatory lending and banks, you know, allowing, uh, you know, taking away this power of the states and of state voters, you know, state voters vote for rate cap. So we've got to make loud and clear that this should be a priority in all the different avenues that we can fight it. Thank you, Lauren and Rebecca. Um, part two of that question, um, Charla, maybe you can, um, since you spoke to this in your presentation, this is, as you pointed out, a racial justice issue fundamentally. How can we expose, best address the offensive and dangerous language used by the OCC and others who are wrapping the proposal in financial inclusion and uh, access to credit or credit access language? Mm -hmm. I think um, thinking about the the quote that um, we shared during the presentation from the acting comptroller. I, I think um, any any pieces, any comments, any statements that you wish to share, noting that this it's it's absurd to insinuate that a product like this would bring people out of poverty, would make them rich um, with these types of rates, with this annual percentage rate. I mean, there's. There's a reason when we think about other types of products that they do not have, in, um, excuse me, APRs that are at this level. And in thinking general, um, what we know about the racial wealth, wealth gap and the gap between um, black and brown communities, people of color, and those who are, um, are their white counterparts, um, this only exacerbates that, right? So the idea that offering a product like this will bring people into the system um, I, it, it, it's absurd and it's unfair to uh, insinuate that. I also think when we talk about access to credit, we have to think about safe and fair access to credit. Um, so countering that language of people need access to credit, true, but is it fair and is it safe and is it equitable for people who, who need that access? And I would argue that this product doesn't do that. And I think um, some of my other colleagues would as well. So I, I welcome any other responses to that. Yeah, and this is Graciela. I'll just add to that. And there's, there's also kind of a similar question from Kelly. Um, the main objection to outlaw predatory lenders continues to be that there are no cheaper alternatives for marginal borrowers. And how do we counter that? So kind of um, along the lines of the of the other question you were answering. So I, I would I would add to that, that you know, right now we're going through, there were tough times before this, very tough times. This pandemic is really shedding the light on, you know, how bad it is uh, for communities of color with, you know, um, not access to healthcare, access to, you know, savings for, for rent and, you know, any emergencies and things like that. And so I think, you know, the predatory lenders are trying to take advantage of that and say, we, we're we here. We're here to save you and we've got all this money to give you. Um, but really, we, we, do not, uh, we do not need these debt trap loans. There's, there's all kinds of other resources that Congress is trying to fight for that counties, that states, that nonprofits, that faith-based organizations are offering. And when you 
um, targets and, and, and infiltrate and like aggressively market your horrible products, you're kind of taking away from what people can really access. And it's a lot harder for nonprofits and faith-based faith -based groups to market their help because they don't have as much money for the marketing. But, you know, people are really pulling together with food banks, with um, help with rent and like, you know, I was infuriated by the, the lack of, of help for undocumented immigrants during COVID, but there are counties that are coming together and pulling money together and trying to help people. And so there, there is help out there. And that's what people need, not these loans. And so I think those are some things that you can think about locally when you're fighting to say, no, we don't need this. This is what we do offer. Um, I'll, I'll pause there for uh, the next question. Um, for unless does anyone want to add to to that to that question? Okay, so um, I'm going to let's see. There, there's there's two questions. Maybe Lisa, I can ping you for this one. Two questions about what states can and should do now. So I think specifically, let's see if I can find them. Is there any, this is from Tom Jacobson, is there any state level legislation that can be enacted to address this? And then there's another one, should states pursue protections during this period? Um, so for the first question, you know, I, we, I know I've been and some of my colleagues who've been giving this some thought. I think the way at least the OCC is proposing the rule right now it feels limited and difficult. Um, maybe Lauren or Rebecca has some thoughts on that, but it does uh, there, for example, I think Lauren mentioned Georgia has uh, by statute um, put in language around what a lender, who a, who a true, essentially who a true lender is and addresses this issue that we, that courts have, have considered. And unfortunately it feels like the way um, the language is written in the OCC's proposal, uh, it would still uh, undercut that. Um, in terms of efforts to, um, but um, I'll answer the second question, and then maybe Rebecca or Lauren, if they have thoughts, um, happy to hear that. Um, in terms of, you know, continued efforts in the states around rate caps, I mean, the or other efforts. I think um, there are continued efforts right now to um, seek protections and to limit um, interest, uh, limit interest rates in the states. You know, not every lender is going to find uh, non-bank lender is going to find uh, a a bank to partner with. They they may not for for whatever reason. So if you're in a state that still allows payday lending or high cost lending. Uh, installment lending, then efforts to limit those rates will still protect against uh, those uh, those types of loans. And it, additionally, it, it uh, campaigns and efforts around state level protections for those lenders in the state and with storefronts and not operating in rent to bank schemes uh, will still be important for the broader message of why uh, why. Uh, these interest rate laws are important and why the efforts that the OCC is pursuing right now are so dangerous uh, and so harmful to people in the state. So those efforts are still yeah. very important. Yeah, and this is Lauren, let me jump in. Um, you know, I think it's a complicated question about whether if a state passed a true lender law like Georgia's, whether that would help or not. Obviously, the OCC would claim that their rule preempts it but there's limits on how they can preempt state laws. And so we'd end up with a litigation fight over whether it was preempted or not. But we'd want to be careful you know, not to have that challenge brought you know, in a state where the courts weren't, weren't favorable. And so there'd be a lot of complicated questions about whether it would make sense to do that kind of challenge. Um, but you know, one of the most important things you can do at the state level is talk to your attorneys general because they got avenues to the courts, you know, as we saw. I mean, D.C., you know, challenged one of their lenders, and that's some of the strongest challenges come from state AGs. They're not subject to arbitration clauses and the hurdles that, you know, borrowers have. And, you know, we want to get 
comments you know, against this rule from as many AGs as possible. And so tell your AGs to oppose this and to join comments against it and to start challenging lenders in court or a minimum just start sending out investigative subpoenas. I mean, DC, uh, two or three lenders left DC before they even filed their lawsuit because they knew DC was investigating and they don't want the headaches. But right now, they'll stick to the states that don't give them trouble. So tell your state, give them trouble. And just, this is Lisa again. Um, you know, def I totally agree with Lauren and one of the forgotten and, you know, sometimes forgotten are state state regulators and the conference of state bank super supervisors put out a very strong statement after the OCC issued its proposal uh, really criticizing the proposal the proposed rule um, you know they this would um, whole very much undercut the work that state regulators banking regulators and non-bank regulators do in overseeing the entities that operate in the state uh, in North Carolina, for example, the state bank regulator pursued rent-to-bank schemes and shut them down. Uh, so, you know, talking to your, just as you might talk to and encourage your state AG to weigh in, talk to your state regulator as well. Let's see. We still have time and we still have some questions. You guys are awesome. Um, so this one, oh, I can't see who asked this one, but um, but someone someone wrote, I'm curious, I had a client in my office and saw on her loan documents that the interest rate was 126%, her signature was on the loan documents. We asked about the interest rate not being able to charge this in our state. The response was, since the loan originated in Nevada, they had to follow Nevada law and not our state law. So I can't see who that person was or what state you are in, but uh, it would be really great for you to contact us <laughs> and uh, share that story with us. We're looking for loan documents like this and stories like this um, from your state. So, um, so whoever that was, please um, uh, contact us to, to get more information. That's, I think this is probably exactly what we're talking about. Um, hey, and let me just add, um, you know, if it's a bank, um, the whole there are federal laws that say banks can charge whatever rate is legal in their home state. If it's not a bank, then usually uh, they can't do that, and um, you know the state, the consumer state laws are going to apply. Great. Um, we may have answered this one before. I'll open this up to to anyone but let me know I feel like you may have you guys may have answered this but if this is uh, from Dave Irvin if there is a change in in who controls the White House with November elections how long does it take to have changes in who controls and leads the OCC and FDIC did you guys answer that already if not um, I kind of answered it Thank you, Rebecca so on the OCC and others are going to need to help me, but on the OCC, because because um, it is it is led by a single director, um, the president can remove the director without cause. Um, I think really as a result of the recent um, Supreme Court decision around the CFPB director, um, and so there. You, you would need to get somebody confirmed by the Senate. You could put in an acting person who's already been confirmed by the Senate. Uh, but ultimately, yeah. So, I mean, I think that the administration could replace folks quickly or whoever is in that role. Um, the FDIC may be different because it's a board. And um, so I, I, I don't know if, I'm not sure. Can someone help me on the FDIC? You know, that's less clear, you know, the implications of the Supreme Court. The other thing I'd say is that um, it's easier to not finalize a rule than it is to overturn one. Even if there is a new head of the OCC, you can't just snap your fingers and you know repeal a rule. They'd have to go through another rulemaking process. That's another reason it's important to get a lot of comments in and unique comments, because the longer it takes the OCC to read through all those comments, 
you know, the longer it takes them to finalize the rule and maybe that gets pushed into next year. I mean, the payday lenders, you know, very successfully bogged down the CFPB by generating tons and tons of comments on the payday rule, including a lot of handwritten comments. And, you know, we want the OCC to have to consider everybody's views. So get those comments in. Okay. I want to make sure to answer this one from Carlos Santana. How, how, this, how this bill is going to hurt um, Latinos financially and our Latino organizations sharing this information in Spanish? So that is a great question and actually something that I'm going to add to our list of things to do is to get some of our materials translated um, because, yeah, it is really important not only to engage and write comments, but also just to, to share this information with your constituents and the, your clients and folks that you're working with. So, um, so I will, you know, as we're working through kind of like our additional resources for for this, we will think about how um, how how we can translate more of our materials and have it more accessible to folks. Okay, so let's see. I think we have time for one more question of the organizers who can see. Are there any questions that you guys um, we've got? We only have time for one more. <laughs> um, Maybe we'll end with this one from Kate Fitzpatrick, if that's, uh, if you guys don't have an, another one. So if a retailer offers to sell its products on credit and the lender is spend wise rates of 150%, you think the retailer is keeping as much as 96% of the profit, question mark, is spend wise giving the retailer the full cost of the borrowed amount up front? Um, um, hi, this is Lauren. I can answer that one. So that's probably about these retail loans I was talking about, like, such as the easy pay loans. And there's actually three parties involved. There's the retailer, the auto mechanic, the furniture store, wherever it is you're buying something for. And yes, they're getting 100% of the cost of their product. They, you know, you, they sell it, they get their money, and they're out of the picture. Then there's the rent -a bank lender, the predatory lender, which is easy pay. And so they're really servicing the loan. But of course, it's been laundered through the bank, and the bank is probably still involved a little bit in the back end. Um, but it, it's, you know, it's the relationship between the rent -a bank lender and the bank where the, the rent -a bank lender is taking, you know, 90, 96% of, of the proceeds. Okay, wonderful. So I think, you know, we have a couple left here. We will, um, I think, if the technology works, I will try to save these and, and answer the other questions directly to the folks that have submitted questions. Um, just want to thank everyone for um, for participating in, in the webinar and staying all the way to the end. Thank you very much. And we will follow up with an email with the recording of the webinar, uh, the slides, additional resources, um, you know, as, as much information as we can. And you guys have those websites where we will be putting up more resources and action items and things we can do. Um, just so you know, right now, this week is Stop the Debt Trap uh, Week of Action. And so there are things going on. So you will see, um, if, if you're part of that coalition, you will see things that happen this week. And then tomorrow, there will be a Twitter storm. And so we will have tweets related to this specifically. Um, so look out for that and look out for um, much more resources. When you have all of our contact information, please feel free to email us. Um, yes, yeah, and thank you everyone for joining.